2011 was highlighted by a wave of revolutions, movements, and occupations. The Middle East saw probably the most revolutionary movements of them all in the form of the Arab Spring. But closer to home, we've had our own uprisings. Starting with the Tea Party movement a few years back, civil unrest and displeasure with the way things have been going has been growing. And this past year, the occupation movements inhabited many locations, including Wall Street, Boston, Oakland, even Houston. What are these protesters looking to change? Historically, how effective have these types of movements been, and what can we expect to learn from the past? And what part is technology playing in all of this? Tonight, has government and big business grown just too strong for the individual voice to ever be heard again? Join us as we take a stand for understanding change. I'm Ernie Manous, and this is Houston 8. Protests, they come in many forms. Letter writing, petitions, sit-ins, walkouts, boycotts, marches, pickets, occupations, hunger strikes, suicides, riots, bombings. The protester longs for change, often at any cost necessary. Joining us tonight, we are pleased to have Dina El Soyel, Associate Director of Women's Study, University of Houston. Dr. Robert Stacy, Dean, Honors College, Houston Baptist University and Mike McMullen, Professor of Sociology, University of Houston, Clear Lake. Before we start, remember you can share your thoughts throughout the show on Twitter using hashtag Houston8. And welcome to all of you. We open this, Rob, I'll start with you down there at the end. We open with this comment about protesters and what's changing, what's going on. Are protesters today different from years ago? Well, I'm not sure that the, the fundamental motivations have changed very much. Uh, people get dissatisfied for good and bad reasons with their lot, and, and it comes time to make a change. So that, 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 those fundamental motivations may not have changed, but certainly the methods have changed. The, you know, the technology available is much different now. Uh, that, that works both to their advantage and sometimes to their disadvantage. Uh, but certainly we live in a, in a different kind of world. Dr. D., what did we learn from the Arab Spring? Was that something revolutionary? I hate to use the word so flippant. But was it something that stood out, and if so, why? Um, I think if you've been following that history, and probably the history of most protests, you'd see that it had been going on for a long time. What made it different this time was the um, ability to see what's happening as it's happening. So the mm -hmm. technology really made a difference here. Uh, and also, the idea of revolution, I'm sort of not comfortable with that word because revolution means something very specific, and that's a complete, comprehensive, sudden change. We haven't really seen the change. It's, it's in process. It could still be a revolution, but that's not clear. Yeah, and Mike, before we get into the whole heated discussion here, Time Magazine naming the protester man of the year. Appropriate, do you think? Uh, I think so, but I think... Uh, um, because of technology, where people who are protesting uh, are aware of each other, uh, they're communicating with each other, and so it's happening everywhere. I mean, protesting has become globalized. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that's very appropriate that uh, the Arab Spring here in the United States, uh, lots of places there's protesting going on. Okay, let's get into the, the meat of the matter here. Take me back and help me understand that the whole concept of protest, when do we see it making its first impact on, on our our history, our culture. When does protest actually become something that is done? And I'll throw, right, you're what, nodding back there, Robert. I'll let you get that one. What a great question. This is a great question. When you speak of our culture, of course, you know, the United States is sort of born out of protest. Uh, there's a reason we call the Tea Party movement the Tea Party movement. It, it refers to a, a, one of our first protests. And so, you know, those, those initial colonists, they perceived a situation in which they were not being treated fairly. Uh, they thought their fundamental rights as Englishmen were being violated, and, and that, that caused them, when they saw that, that from their point of view, that, that the usual mechanisms were not going to work to fix that, they went sort of outside those mechanisms, outside the law, as it were, and, and things like the Boston Tea Party were the result. But what about in mankind? Well, and that, I just want to add, that's something we probably have in common. Uh, a lot of the countries of the so-called Middle East are born from protest as well, uh, uh, taking away the yoke of colonialism and independence. As far as mankind, so you want to go back to the Stone Age. Well, not necessarily <laughs> even the Stone Age, but I, I think to myself in my, my poor history of the world, and I think, you know, you had your rulers, you had your, in a sense, dictators and these monarchs and all of that, 
And when somebody stepped out of line, they were ended. You know, they, they didn't have that freedom. When does protest start to really, when do people realize they can pull together and make change? So you're talking about mass public yeah. protest. Yeah, that's interesting. I would think it would be very early on. It seems to be one way to get things done. So, for example, in the United States, you have many vehicles to express your different opinions. Uh, in other countries, the spectrum may not be as broad. So sometimes people take to the streets, and that might be the second step or the third step. Here you might write letters to your congressman and, and so on. So I would imagine it's always gone on, particularly when there aren't other options. Mm -hmm. right. I, I think that there's probably also a connection between mass protests and the uh, beginning of democratic movements, that uh, as democracy spread, uh, it, people's consciousness was raised that, oh, we have, we have a voice, uh, maybe a small one at the beginning, but uh, you know, as democracy spreads, I think uh, people's realization that they, uh, they can do something, they can affect right. change. The founding of our country, I was, oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I was just going to say that it probably has to do with empowerment, um, and I would maybe say not so much democracy as empowerment, because some of the biggest protests have come from pretty oppressive regimes, mm -hmm. right, where there isn't the sense of democracy, but there's a sense that I can't take it anymore, and I'm a human being. So the sense that I am somebody and I can make change. But, but usually that happens um, after people's expectations get raised. Mm -hmm. So you can, right. you can be oppressed for a long time, and if there's no clear... Uh, recourse, then you probably will not do much. Mm -hmm. But if your expectations are raised, maybe because of slight increases in freedom or uh, changing economic circumstances, uh, that's when people tend to say, well, maybe I can do yeah. something about this. Absolutely, absolutely. And th I think the term is relative deprivation. So you see right. it on, when you see uh, people living a certain way on TV or you hear about it or your neighbors are living a certain way and there's a, 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 a gap in the um, income distribution and so on, then you think this is not right. But you don't have a sense of this is not right when you... Right, you know, the haves and the mm -hmm. have-nots. Right. When you see what the haves have yeah. and you realize you have right. not, then it comes the desire to... I'm not sure even, is it always to have what they have or to level the playing field. What do you find in most movements? Is it a desire to it, want more or to want equality? I'm not sure it's always equality necessarily. It's, um, you know, there's sort of, sort of basic needs that we all have and if we don't feel those needs are met or we won't be able to soon meet them in the future, uh, we're not thinking of equality, we're thinking of just sort of, you know, survival or, 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 you know, having some basic minimum standard met. I was thinking of Mike's point, you know, a great recent illustration, of course, is the, is the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's, you know, kind of a big event in our, our lifetimes. Uh, Gorbachev's perestroika program raised their expectations some, and not a lot, not, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a massive restructuring, uh, but it was enough to sort of get that ball rolling, to sort of tip it over, and, and, and we see the result was a, was a massive result. When we look at least at this country's history, the successful movements that we've had, we've said already the, the American Revolution, what other revolutions, what other protests do you feel have been the most successful that we've had? Well, surely the civil rights civil movement rights. was, yes, was yeah. important. Uh, women's rights, um, to some degree. Um, it's interesting you use the word success, and some famous guy, I don't know who now, but said that <laughs> it's too soon to tell. Right. <laughs> so the question asked him was, was the, is the French Revolution a successful event? <laughs> we, who was it this time? I don't know. That's a good one. <laughs> but we, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. You know, it's still, right. it's still forming. It's still, as, as historians, we, you know, there's, there's time. But we look at it and we say about, like, I, I stumble into success, were they success? And we come up with three that come to mind. I wonder to myself then, are, are these protests actually productive? Do they really work? Or is it just the strange, odd ones, the rare ones that actually succeed what they set out to do? And is this really the best way to go about affecting change? Well, it really kind of depends. I guess that's a good academic answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes the protests are small and very localized, but very successful. Uh, just recently here in the Houston area, uh, some nursing mothers got together to protest outside of Target a store in which they thought that, uh, that, that a mother was sort of being harassed for nursing her child. And as far as I can tell, I don't think Target's harassing nursing mothers anymore. So in a <laughs> sense, that, that's a successful protest, even though it only involved maybe 15 people. Uh, we see what happened in Bahrain, though, recently, where thousands of people showed up to protest, and they were just put down, and that mm -hmm. was it. So it, it really kind of, you know, the scale matters, the, you know, the situation, the particular circumstances matter, and certainly time matters. These things usually don't happen quickly.
Mm -hmm. But um, maybe it, with the case of Bahrain and, and the nursing mothers, maybe we, what, what do we mean by success? Have right. they affected change in policy? Is that what we mean? Or, or is it? I, I would say even as far as they've affected the change in policy that they are asking for. Mm -hmm. Policy might change, but it <laughs> might not true. be what they want <laughs> right. necessarily. But maybe also, depending on the um, the regime and the system in place, just going outside and saying, I don't like this, is a form of success. Which then leads me right into the Occupy movements. Because I've seen people saying, you know, we, we simply gathering to protest is causing change and making a difference. But is it? Is there anything they can, I hate to use this, but hang their hat on that mm -hmm. they have achieved? But, and there's a million questions I have, so I'll just stop sure. right there and we'll talk about it from this point. Well, I think it's too early to tell. I think, <laughs> I think they're, yeah. they're still trying to figure out what, what is our message because there's a lot of... But is it really too early to tell in the fact that they started large and they have been dwindling in numbers, mm -hmm. it's gotten smaller and smaller, and now they seem like nuisances instead of movements anymore? And so when you say it's too soon to tell, the impact of at least this first wave would it be safe to say it didn't it didn't affect change uh, that's probably true i mean that not the change that they wanted but it, i think it raised consciousness and you know as you were saying that that might be the first step and that might be a long time in coming that might take a decade or so uh mm -hmm. for it to happen so you see kind of it waxes and wanes and uh i don't think i, th I think the issues that the occupy movement is protesting against aren't going to go away you know the the income inequality and the the seeming lack of, of uh, a voice in our society, um, that's, I don't think that's going to change soon. So I think the, the seeds that they're protesting against are still going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, maybe the first battle is, seems like they lost, but it's, it's going to be a long, long protracted, uh, uh, you know, uh, area of, of protest, I think. I, I tend to agree, except I think that, that one of the reasons we saw the Occupy movement develop as it did when it did was because of the economic conditions our country is in, and those are not permanent. It's cyclical. They'll come back. Mm -hmm. but, but they'll also, you know, we're going to recover from this recession. I know maybe people don't know, always think so, but we will. And, and that's going to that's make it less fruitful for movements like the Occupy movement. And I think, conversely, even the Tea Party, they just won't have the motivation they had before, and they won't, they won't have sort of the, you know, the, the, that underpinning that, that sort of sort of galvanizes them to the degree they are organized and galvanized. Uh, when that passes, it gets harder, I think, for those kind of movements to, to, to even sort of to even be cohesive. Right. Jackie? I was going to say that um, as a professor, as a college professor, I, I, I love that people are thinking beyond the immediate. So to, to leave the comfort of their home and to risk so much, really, it is such a risk. And um, in the U.S. and other countries, it, it, it could mean... It could mean a lot of violence. It could mean anything. But they're doing it. And to me, that is a success. They're thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't have to agree with them, even. And what we've been kicking around in our office, too, is the similarities between the Tea Party and the Occupy movement. And I'm not sure a Tea Party person and an Occupy person would agree on that, necessarily. But that they both come out of this, they were un unhappy with the way things were going. And so the Tea Party stands up to say, we need a voice. And yet they end up becoming a very strong if still a minority voice mm -hmm. within at least one party in mm -hmm. our political system, which has affected change if you're simply watching the primaries right. as they play out right. right now. So the Tea Party has made some kind of a foothold in what's going on. It doesn't seem to be what they had started off to do necessarily. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the Occupy movement, and I get the feeling that they haven't made that kind. They haven't gotten in the way the Tea Party did. They don't have a voice at the table right now. Is that, some, is that a safe statement to make? I think that is, politically speaking, I think that is an accurate statement. Uh, whether that remains the case, uh, could, the, could the Occupy movement maybe, could it transform into something of more political influence? I, I suppose it could. I'm skeptical that that will happen, but it's certainly a possibility. Uh, the Tea Party, in a sense, because of their political success, will be around for a while probably. Uh, but at the same time, that success is sort of purchased with a degree of compromise. Uh, so that they aren't the radical movement they were. They are sort of assimilating more and more into an affiliate wing of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I suppose in some level that, that works for them uh, in a way that maybe that would never have worked for the Occupy movement. They would probably not be satisfied, for example, to be a wing of the Democratic Party. Am I too, I don't want to say, too corporate to look at the Occupy movement and say there was no structure there, there was no leadership, there was no simple message to be put out? 
and I evaluate them on that term, am I, uh, terms, am I wrong for doing that because I'm actually, in a sense, speaking a different language than they're speaking? Is that... Do you even understand what well, no, I Well, no, I understand what you're saying. I, um, I think they... Uh, my perspective is that, you, kind of as you said in the, in the introduction to the, to the show, that both the Occupy movement and the Tea Party movement are two sides of a similar coin in that the, you know, there's large bureaucratic power out there that I think individuals feel like we don't have a lot of voice in. The Tea Party movement is saying the, the real problem is government power. The Occupy movement is saying the real problem is corporate power. Mm -hmm. So I think they're both right, in a sense. The Tea Party movement maybe has gotten, I don't want to say co-opted yet, but I mean they, yet, but the, the, their success has come at the price mm -hmm. of uh, they're less radical, they're, they're more uh, mainstream. Um, I think the Occupy movement is still trying to find its voice. Um, Historically, do you have to become less outside the system to affect change? Do you have to in some way play the game of the ruling power. Dr. D? I think that what you were saying before, are you too corporate, um, is, is probably a good description. You have to package it properly. Even if it's unintentional packaging, it has to resonate for it to be successful. And maybe there's somebody organizing all of this and maybe not, but it has to have some variables to, to make it work. And one is organization, one is a good message. Uh, and I mean, you could list the variables that you need. So yeah, compromise is part of it. Maybe you start here, but then you compromise and work within the system. At least you hope that that's... Is there any similarities you can pull between the Occupy movement and what happened in Egypt this spring? There's definitely similarities in terms of um, the people feeling that they want change and going out and trying to get it for themselves. Absolutely. So, yes, and, th and that would be an interesting research paper, actually, to look at those sorts of things. But uh, there's been a history of protest in Egypt. The Egyptian protest is more um, centered on certain issues that are kind of clearer. And it's, it's always been like that historically in Egypt. And it is about basic necessities, about the bread riots in 1977. So it, it just, it, it, there are similarities and then there are some important differences as well. The Arab Spring that we paid so much attention to this spring and into the summer and all that was going on in what we call the Middle East, I wonder, is it because the media put such attention on it that it altered what was going on there and that the success now that we look at and say, well, wait a minute, now there's troubles again. Are we changing the system by the media getting involved? Is it making a change in what's... And you're, you're all nodding like bobbleheads here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I, I think there's no question that since maybe um, Desert Storm, which was 1990, mm -hmm. the media is a player. And maybe before that, too, but on this level of CNN, you know, 24 hours and there's news and there's a cycle and so on and so on, it matters. So there's that. But there's also the technology of how people communicate with one another, you know, especially young people. Uh, Twitter and Facebook, I, you know, right. I don't even know what they're for, really. Someone my age doesn't understand what they're for, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but they know how to use them, and they've become these political tools. So that's a, that's a huge difference, and it does matter. I wouldn't say the media is orchestrating it, but the media is an actor, mm -hmm. definitely. But, but the media has always been a player. I mean, I think back to the civil rights movement, and one of the geniuses of Martin Luther King was that he understood in order for a protest to have weight, uh, it has to be televised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, otherwise it remains local. But, right. you know, the national impact that the civil rights movement had was because the television cameras... Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing the, right. the reaction of uh, the Birmingham officials. And that was being uh, displayed in Pravda, in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. And so there was all this geopolitics right. that was even coming into it. So I, I think the media has always been a player. I just now that it's 24-7, it's mm -hmm. as you say, right. and, it's, and, it's, and the media has become more democratized. Instead of only key players having access to the media, now with Twitter and Facebook, Everybody does. Robert? It, it matters what, what the media sees, right? Uh, Dr. King was ahead of his time, I think, in this uh, regard. Uh, absolutely. You know, he, he advocated nonviolent protest, and there are lots and lots of good philosophic reasons for that, but a, a media-driven reason for that is that if I'm just a middle-of-the-road, ordinary <coughs> American watching the news every evening, and I see the white person beating the black person every time, and it's never the other way around, if it's always the nonviolent one being the victim, 
if I'm just a, if I'm not, not if I'm a racist, I already have my problems. But if I'm an ordinary person, I start to think eventually, well, that's that's not right. That's wrong. That shouldn't mm -hmm. be happening. But, and, and he understood it, it mattered what was on. But those demons take it to, to as I started with the Arab Spring and talking about that and the comments you all made about it's too soon to tell. You're now trying to put this movement into a television time frame. And so we need to know, okay, this is the end point. They had success or <laughs> failure. And then we can move on to the next story. Right. And that a movement doesn't quite end like that necessarily. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem with the reporting we're getting out of Egypt about, well, look at it. It didn't work now. They're, they're fighting again in the streets instead of letting it actually evolve. But, but a lot of times the media does a, a static a mm -hmm. picture, you know? So mm -hmm. there is no context. There is no history of Egypt. This is an ancient civilization. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where is that? And how do we, don't we have to understand that to understand this? Right. In the United States, you grow up with that history of the U.S. So you can, you can say the civil rights movement and you know what all of that means. But when we're looking at some place that isn't as familiar, we need the context. But the media never gives you that context, right? Mm -hmm. It's right now, right here, this man died, and then we're off to the weather. Right. <laughs> but right. I think we still had, continuing the comparison with the Civil Rights Movement, I think we st the media made the same mistake there, that, uh, you know, Emmett Till and so forth went back to the mid-1950s, mm -hmm. and uh, King was still doing his, his thing up until 1968. Right. So this was, you know, a 10, 15, 20-year process that, um, so there's not a one event that made the Civil Rights Movement. It was a right. series right. of uh, give and take, uh, protest, and even King said, now we need to stop for a while and then re-energize. So I think we're going to see the same thing in Egypt, um, mm -hmm. or the, the, all of the Arab Spring. Um, oh, absolutely. It, it's going to go on. It's not, it's not successful or not successful yet. It's still playing out. It's still, but the big mm -hmm. difference is that there's no Dr. King. There's no, right, right. no you know, like strong, charismatic but leadership. Do we need that because we need the spokesperson back to the media so that they've got someone to put on the evening news, that they've got someone we can relate to, we can see them as the symbol for. And without that, can we not understand the story? I think that helps us understand the story, mm -hmm. but you, you, a movement needs leadership. Um, I don't know about the charismatic, I, I suppose it has to be charismatic, but there are leaders, the, the young people in Egypt and, and other places in the Arab Spring, but um, we don't know them yet. or. or but, but I'm they're there. Turn on a dime here and say, <laughs> but with Twitter, with Facebook, mm -hmm. do you still need a central leader? Yeah. Because yeah. everyone can get their point out. Because we, we mentioned it briefly, and I, I'm sorry, Dr. D, if you don't know what Twitter's for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry, yeah. And I, I use it and I still don't know what it's for either. <laughs> but everyone can get their messages out, and the news can find out what they're thinking, what they're saying mm -hmm. by grabbing the tweets, grabbing the postings, grabbing the blogs, and the, face, and the, the website updates, and all of that. So hasn't the computer in some way replaced the leader image to That's get our information from? That's a very interesting theoretical question, but somehow, and I, I don't have support for this, I think that because, of the, because we have so much information and our lives are so full, we need um, bullets, you know, mm -hmm. we, and so we need someone to deliver the bullet. It has to be, yeah, I think that there has to be a mm -hmm. face, an almost iconic face to all of this, for it to be successful in the way that you want to make it successful. It helps yeah. a lot. Whether it's absolutely necessary, I don't know. It's kind of funny, because with all that we've just said here, I'm thinking to myself, when you think of the civil rights movement, you see an image of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. When you think of the Arab Spring, I see the image of Twitter, their logo <laughs> on the screen, because they're going to be showing us what the tweets are, what people are saying. So I wonder if some way, there's something else you can put into your <laughs> thesis when you, when you look into this. Are these going to work? Are, are we at a point, we started the show with this question, and so I throw it back out to mm -hmm. you. Is there any way that a voice of you, me, a group of us together can make a change, in, especially in our culture, where the world of big business and big government and the money and the control is so massive can we be heard anymore, or are we just being entertained, allowed to do what we need, and then we'll go back to our lives? There's a lot of entertainment happening. Um, I don't want to, maybe it's just my own sort of moral position. I don't want to say no. I don't want to say the answer to your question is, I'll oh, forget it, we're all doomed. <laughs> but I have a hard time thinking of counter-arguments, and this is, this is maybe the problematic piece of that. Uh, I remember early on in the Occupy, all, Occupy Wall Street portion of that movement, uh, watching a televised interview between two people. I, they weren't leaders, they were just 
occupiers they were occupying. And, uh, and I don't remember what they were talking about, but I remember that the one fellow was holding a Starbucks coffee cup in his hand <laughs> while protesting corporate business. And the fellow next to him, we didn't really say anything. It's more like a henchman wearing an American Eagle Outfitters T-shirt. <laughs> You know that's that's that seems to me closer to sort of a hobby than than a life or death struggle like we're seeing, for example, in places like Egypt. Right. Maybe the um, the way to look at this is to say that we we have to believe that we can make change. Mm -hmm. If we don't believe that, then that's tremendous. That's tremendous. So we have to really believe that, and I think that's what keeps the engine going. You know, we ha I have to believe that if I really felt strongly about something, I can change it, whether it's here or Cairo or Bahrain or wherever it is. I can make it change. I just don't feel like it right now, maybe, you know? Yeah. And, and the irony is that with all this new technology, I think it, um, it makes it more likely that mm -hmm. there might be change because there is the kind of a democratizing of information available, uh, communication and so forth. And that's unfortunately, what, that's we're hope. not a democracy and we're out of time, so I have to <laughs> cut you off there. Thank you. What an entertaining and interesting and informative discussion. Thank you for coming in. Now, each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org slash Houston 8. There you can read about the guests, learn more about the topic, and even watch past episodes. Now, next week on Houston 8, a look at what options are available to those who do not have or cannot afford acceptable housing. Whose responsibility is it to take care of those who have not? That's next Friday night on Houston 8 at 8 right here on Channel 8. Thank you for joining us, and that does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manoos. Have a great week. Thanks.